session this morning, uh, which will deal with modus operandi and uh, trademarks or signatures. And we have a guest speaker this morning who will be sharing his vast insight and experience um, in this field. And we are very pleased to join, uh, to welcome him this morning. Um, it's Mr. Gideon Jones. And Gideon, the floor is yours. Tell us a little bit about yourself, please. Good morning, everyone. Yeah, I see I'm, I've got 38 years of experience, actually already 40. I'm getting old. But yes, I've been a detective for 19 years, also worked undercover operations and organized crime. And then I've been a forensic investigator for 20 years, I think, 22 years now. So my investigation knowledge is quite extensive. And I've actually done literally, literally a few thousand cases in my career, spanning every kind of case you can think of. So that is basically my background in terms of of um, of knowledge and experience. And then, yes, guys, I've, I've, I've been a lecturer at quite a wide number of institutions, also taught police officers, intelligence officers, organized crime, anti-corruption all over Africa. So that is basically my, uh, my, my, my skills lies in investigation from crime scenes and then specifically how to obtain statements and work with people and get information from people. Yes, that's about it. Um, Gideon, we spoke briefly about the, the skills of an investigator, um, how grounded the investigator must be, but also that the investigator should never stop um, honing their skills and improving their skills. Can you can you speak just briefly about this and why it's important? Yes, I, I think one thing that I've learned through all the years is that as Badandine would know, we're busy writing a book and about half of the contents of all the chapters we are changing because of changes in our modern day society, of technological change uh, changes of how things are progressing, of legal changes, of court cases that we have to follow. Um, guys, it's, it's not a set thing. We change as, you know, that old cliche, change is a constant. It, it is really the truth. And you have to stay abreast of it. And then we've discussed a case where Marissa Parani played in a technical part in, in that I want to talk to you guys about. And that case took place, for instance, in days when, the, when DNA, in the 80s, when DNA wasn't freely available. Um, today, we sit with chat GP, we sit with artificial intelligence, we sit with communication, cell phones. We, we're really in a very difficult and a very challenging environment. And, and things do change. Things do change. Things change dramatically. And... Uh, another example, we started out with checkbooks. You guys probably don't even know what a checkbook is. Check fraud was very big. Now we don't use checkbooks. So it has disappeared. So every crime that disappears, there's something new that takes its the place. Yeah. And crimes change over, over time. New phenomena, new patterns. One of the new buzzwords in South Africa in terms of crime it's actually high, uh, um, well, hijackings have been now for us for, for a while, but we talk about uh, illegal mining. That's become a big, serious crime issue. Uh, you can think of commercial crime, specifically cyber crime has become a big and a major issue. Uh, Bitcoin, you can take Bitcoin and the, the fraud that surround Bitcoin. I mean, crooks want to deal in Bitcoin, although I think <laughs> That's not a good thing to do, but it's really evolving. Everything is evolving all the time. And uh, so you can never stop learning. The moment you stop learning is the moment you're not relevant. I think that is the key. Certain things will always, certain basics will always remain the same. Basics cannot be undone. But you have to understand that as you go along, you have to keep on learning, keep on going further. Keep on seeing what new case law, for example, there is. And, and that changes all the time. And you have to keep abreast of it. 
Okay, and then uh, you want me to... Okay, sorry, anything else on that topic, Bernadine? Um, okay, so thank you for sharing the value and the importance of, of continuously learning and continuously yes. and, and why, why it happens and why it's necessary. Um, so today we're going to chat about modus operandi, um, what it is, uh, why it's necessary. I think our first slide is basically just, just what it is. Um, you and I chatted briefly before the session about how how complex modus operandi actually is. Um, yes. So so share with us your your insights in terms of what modus operandi is and perhaps um, why why it's important and what it's used for. Before we get to the the other section on on trademarks and and signatures, please, Gideon. Okay. The thing with modus operandi is, and I think we can take it back from uh, when you start with whatever you do, all criminals, all people for that matter, we, we are psychologically wired to do things the same way we did it, as long as it works. If it, if it works, and if you are successful, you will keep on using and doing it the same way. Now, therein lies a danger, but therein also lies your comfort of knowing that the way to do it will probably lead to success. And that is where modus operandi comes in. You know, you can take a very simple example of a person. Um, uh, I'll go a bit out of the, the investigation environment, more in the psychological, interpersonal environment, where I say on courses, you know that we call it the bath tub, where you sit on the, the outlet against the taps. When you take a bath in a relationship for the first time with your partner, female, male, doesn't matter. The person who sits on the rounded side versus the person who sits against the hot and the cold, uh, cold uh, taps and on the tub where the drain uh, where the drain is situated. If you start sitting there in the beginning of a relationship, the chances are very good that 10 years later, that's exactly where you will sit when you take a bath with your partner. What I'm saying, if you, you for another example, you go and sit in a new, you attend a course and you go and sit in a specific place. The chances are 90% that you will continue sitting in the same place because you're comfortable in it. Now, that takes us from the psychological perspective to the crime or the criminal. By saying this, if a criminal conducts a crime and he or she is successful in it, they will probably stick to the same formula, the same way of doing things because they are successful in doing it that way. Yes, they will evolve over time. If they are caught, well, that will stop it. And they will pro pro perhaps progress when they go to prison and they, they hear the story and they go to the prison university. They learn new things there. But the way people will conduct crime usually stays the same. Now, the thing about crime, people or criminals who commit crime tend not to stop. It's a fallacy that, that criminals will commit one crime, make money and stop. Uh, you almost never see it. It, it's people like to say it's it's for the money is because they're poor. Think about a cash and transit robber. He might be poor, but now he makes his first million rand. Do you think that cash and transit robber stops? No, he's not going to stop. Statistics tells us he will stop until he's killed or something happens, arrested, etc. But the moment he's got money, he will continue. He or she will probably continue. They will come better at it because if they don't, they'll get arrested. Now, let us go to a, a, a little bit further in, in practical terms. A person who commits a burglary, usually criminals start at the bottom. They don't start being a cash and transit robber for the first time. What they do, they start to be petty criminals, street criminals. And if they're successful, they progress and they go to bigger crimes. That's the norm. Not always, but that is the norm. Then they'll start engage in, in street robberies, for example. Then they will progress into 
gang related activities perhaps they'll go on the route of 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 narcotics start smuggling narcotics perhaps they will become fraudsters perhaps they will go into the line where they involved in hard crimes serious crimes crimes like theft housebreaking robbery now let us say you go into vehicle robberies some of those robbers stays in that environment for the rest of their life some of them progress and they become in cash and transit robbers some become house robbers it, it, it all depends on the person's skill level where is and where is comfortable and how effective he or she is and how much money they make uh, a crook is also an optimist a crook is also a a person who wants to make money greed plays a very important role so if you can make money and there's an easier way or a better way to make money that's exactly what people will do they will start doing it making it that way but yes usually certain criminals will conduct his activities then in the way that he or she is comfortable in in the environment they're comfortable in and they will use the tools that they are comfortable with and they will probably use the same gang or the same people they will associate with the same people again they trust them because they've committed crime before and that is how your modus operandi starts to 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 take place and where you start to get the discerning differences between individuals and groups and specific crimes and I've spoken to Bernardine about the specific crimes that I investigated many, many years ago in the 1980s, where DNA still did not play a role. In this case, we investigated a group of people who committed burglaries. It was about a gang of three, if I remember correctly. Now, the modus operandi of that gang, we could establish it because it the incidents took place in the same areas. In this case, I think it was in Sunnyside. And they targeted flats that were situated on the second floor or the first floor, the ground floor, the floor just above the ground floor. So they never went into the entrance. They used, not ladders, but they used devices to get to the first floor. They couldn't get to the second, third, or fourth floor, but they targeted the second floor because they worked out how to get into flats that way. Now, what they would do, they will also go and commit the burglary at uh, 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock in the morning. They will open the windows because on that floor, people left their windows open. Those years, there, uh, there weren't a lot of uh, uh, burglar bars. And what they would do, they would open it, cut, break it a little bit, put tape on the window, Break the tape, break the window. The tape will will keep the glass intact. They will open the window that way. You can't hear a thing. It's very quiet. Then they will send in the one guy who's the smallest to open it from inside. They will other two. One will be outside to keep watch. One will be at the window to receive the stolen goods, and the one will enter. Now, interestingly, you would think that people will will be awake or will be awakened and this guy told me that he's committed more than more than a hundred break-ins and not one of them the people were woken during the the house breaking and sometimes the people even had dogs and you would say yeah the dog will hear and make a noise if that's what the crooks tell me very seldom does it happen if they are very good at what they do? Now, this young man's modus operandi, or I would actually now go to trademark, included in the modus operandi, he would go and defecate on the kitchen table and leave his signature. Now, that defecation is basically a psychological part of it it's it's a sign that he leaves or that he left that says something about himself the other two people that formed part of the gang they did not do it they would use the same modus operandi break in the same way go for the same type of flat steal the same stuff that they could sell at a pawn shop but they would not defecate 
So they shared the modus operandi as a gang. They shared the way how they broke in, when they broke in, where they broke in, what they stole, how they stole it, where they sold it. But they differed in, they did not have the same signature, that very psychological personal signature of the person who defecated on the, the table in the, in the kitchen or in the living room. Now, when we caught them, we could prove, I think, 20 cases where we found fingerprints. Uh, no, a few. Sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm mistaken. We found one or two or three fingerprints because they were very clever. They also used gloves. They were very good at it. And how we actually could then link them up to, I think, 60 or 70 cases is through modus operandi. And we had to explain to the court when we charged them. And that's how we could get connect the dots as investigators. We went because we knew our environment, we knew our area. So every case where we found the same modus operandi, date, time of the week, day of the week, how they broke in, time of the day, how they broke through the window, what they stole. And then importantly, which formed part of the bigger modus operandi, the defecation on the table, but which was the signature of one of the guys, that actually brought all those cases together. And in court, the whole gang was convicted. Majority of cases, we did not have any physical evidence other than the modus operandi. And it was accepted in court and they were sentenced to, to some pretty serious jail time. Now, very interesting modus operandi can be used as evidence. But it has to be really very strong in the sense that let us take cash and... Okay, first on this, let me first stop there and, and, and ask if we are on the right track, Bernadine. 100%, Fidion. Um, as, you, as you are talking, I'm, I'm popping notes in for the student to just underscore uh, the importance of what you are saying. No, you're 100% on the right track. Okay, so Marissa Parani, what happened? You can only... From an investigation point of view, you really have to do a very good crime scene investigation. You have to note exactly how the premises, and I'm taking this now as a case example, how it was broken into. That's, that tape that was uh, uh, placed on the window, a hammer or an object used to tap it, it broke, but just a small hole, and the glass was, was retained by the, the tape itself, so it didn't fall, it didn't make a noise, and then the window was opened. Now that is a, is a very clear, specific way of doing it. If you look at the day, I think they broke in in the middle of the week. They like to break in at winter time because they said that people were sleeping very, very soundly. They broke in after two o'clock in the morning because they said that people were sleeping and the pets, the dogs, were also sleeping at that time of the day. They will very, they will enter uh, also a flat, sunny side, uh, middle of the week, two or three o'clock in the morning, through the window, the first story or the one just above the ground. Those are specifics, but it must be. Um, noticed and it must be recorded by the investigators and must be photographed. Otherwise, you will lose the evidential value of it. They would open up drawers and not cause ruckus. They will do it in such a way that people often did not know that they have been the victims of a break-in. The next morning, we have had a few cases on this specific crook, if I remember correctly, where people realized the money was gone, taken out of the wallet. They never took the wallet. They would realize that the watch is gone and certain valuables were lost. But often they did not even know that their premises was broken into. They only realized that a day or two afterwards when they saw the window, the broken window, very small hole, or they realized that and they more than one thing was missing. So these guys were very neat, very quiet, very tidy. But obviously, sorry, I, in this case, I knew it because there was defecation on the table. That was an immediate death giveaway. 
I'm, 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 I shouldn't get confused with another gang that I refer to. So that immediately uh, uh, told them that they were the victims. They didn't know it until they saw the defecation. That is how. Okay, and the scenes were, co were noted correctly, and they were noted in detail. So that made it possible to put them together and string a very, very, very tight and a very strong modus operandi uh, case against these guys. Now, let us go take a modern day example of cash and transit. Cash and transit, the modus operandi of all the different gangs, of the various gangs that exist, are basically the same. What do I say by that? In almost all of the cases, the gang, which consists between 10 and 30 people, depending on what they want to eat, will get together. They will go to a Sangoma. They will get medicine. Sometimes the Sangoma will go to the scene and also put medicine on where they want to eat the cash and transit van. They will have a person who drives a vehicle into the cash and transit van. That is very similar. The majority of them do it. They will have groups that act as stopper groups, groups that will shoot at the cash and transit vehicle and force it to stop. Then they will have another vehicle with a person who will handle the explosives and the explosive will be used to shoot open the, the door of the cash and transit van. Then they will set the vehicles alight and they will uh, uh, drive away from the scene in one, two, three, four vehicles, depends on how much money they were targeting. Now, that modus operandi is applicable to almost all of the cash and transit gangs. But there are differences within the modus operandi. With other words, one specific driver will prefer a Mercedes 300 as the vehicle he uses to ram the cash and transit van. Uh, a specific driver will use a specific vehicle. One who works the explosives, every explosive expert rigs up his bomb or his explosives in a different manner. So you, you can see from the, also the weapons are very similar, R5s and AK, so you can't see too much from it. But guys, from it, and if you do the very good crime scene investigation, you will find similarities that you can link one gang to another. Also, for example, what they say to the to the victims, the language they speak, the way they are clothed, the what they say to people, the words, the specific words, very important stuff, because words being used, phrases that are being spoken, often determines that modus operandi, and actually makes it unique to a specific gang, and and. I've, I've very seldom see that being emphasized, but it's important that phrases, the language, who speaks, how they speak, what they say, often makes the distinguishing details between one group and another group. Now, when we talk about modus operandi and signatures, and, and I referred to your guideline, specific your trademark or signature, Modus operandi, if you look at what the Latin term is, because modus operandi is a Latin term. And, 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 and if you look at the term itself, if you uh, convert it into English, it will probably die verbatim says um, method of operation. Now that incorporates all kinds of characteristics, the way you do things. How you carry out your tasks, your activities, your operations. In a criminal beer, you can also include methods, patterns of behavior. Um, and for instance, uh, yeah, the way you kill a victim in, 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 if you, in serial killing cases, the way a person is, is killed, that stands out. Now, that is a broad term. It, it, it takes everything into its, under its umbrella. What was said, how it was done, the victim, every single aspect should be taken into consideration to determine the modus operandi. Now, when you go to a signature, 
Signature is usually a small component, specific component, relevant to the psychological aspect of one or two or more, usually one of the perpetrators. Sometimes it's a ritualistic thing. Like in the example I gave you of the person who defecated, it was a group of three people, but only one would defecate on the table, which means the group shared the modus operandi. Everything they did was the same, except the defecation. That was a signature of one of the three guys. But that defecation, that signature, also became part of the modus operandi of the group itself. So I don't want to confuse you on this. The best way to approach it is to, to, to record everything. What has happened? How it was planned can be part of a, of a modus operandi. You know that we often find medicine, traditional medicine on a crime scene. Or you find the suspect with specific medicine. Or the vehicle. We often found that. Often, often, often. You will find stuff in the vehicle, in one of the vehicles being used in the crime, which is specific to a specific Sangoma. And that is specific to a specific group because different groups use different Sangomas. Guys, very interesting. But you note everything. Anything might be of value that you did not previously think might have been of value. But the moment you find that one very unique thing on a crime scene or in a crime, and you find another incident or another incident or crime or investigation that shares the same unique characteristics, it broadly will go under description of modus operandi and you can present it as such as evidence in a court of law. Okay, uh, hopefully I've uh, I've um, I've said something that you uh, I don't know, Bernadine. Anything yeah, no. Else um, we go along before we go on this. Gideon, I I think I think you've covered everything, um, but I think the litmus test now will will be when we open the floor for questions, uh, because yes. I think we are at the end of the. Um, of the session, yeah, that's just me telling the okay, students okay. that the I, next I, session. Let, let me just say one last thing the, yes. that I should say that is important. Guys, you know that modus operandi and signatures do evolve. They don't always stay the same. As crooks become cleverer or more de developing, older, etc., sometimes, or often, or usually, actually, there is, an, there is a, a growth in the modus operandi, or there is a change in the modus operandi, or and sometimes with the signature itself, the instrument being used, or whatever. But they be very careful that you see two different, which appear face value different modus operandi, and it might be the same group that evolved, or the circumstances of the crime was a little bit different. That is why details should be noted thoroughly. There might be an evolvement, which at first glance, you will think it's not the same perpetrator or perpetrators. Okay, I think that had to be said as well. Yes, I think that's that's important because that speaks to the also to the why of, of why we look for things at, at the crime scene. And um having said that, Gideon, one of the one of the key characteristics or skills that a, a, an investigator should have, I mean, there are many, we've had this discussion many times, but is to be able to, to be observant, to observe and to record um, what you see um, in a notebook. Um, some people I know use voice notes, they record on their, on their cell phones. Um, so recording of what you see in real time is also vitally, vitally important. I, I, I want to come in here and I'll say you from many years of experience and I testified in many, many court cases and do many, did many cases. And I will tell you what the judges told me and what magistrates and prosecutors told me and advocates. And 
what they would say is detail, detail, detail. Record, record, record. Everything must be recorded. And how do you do that? Photographs, photographs, photographs. Guys, also recordings when you interview. I, I guarantee you that you miss half of the details. On a crime scene, you take 100 to 200 photographs. I'm just giving an example, but you take a mini. Later on, you will find stuff on it that you did not observe initially. It happens all the time. Mm. Detectives are not masters. They are not these, these uh, what you see on TV detectives. It's nonsense. You usually, when you go through the case, in almost all cases that I was involved with, you find things that you've overlooked initially. But because you took photographs, because you recorded everything, because you detailed everything, and you made notes on the scene, and I've, when I testified, many defense lawyers told me, it is very difficult. The moment you sit with an investigator, you're dealing with the investigator who has to testify. And that investigator made notes and wrote a statement based on the notes and took photographs that have got date and time stamps on it. How do they fight that evidence? Mm. It's like almost one. impossible. Mm. That is the secret of a good investigator. He's not clever. He yeah. just focuses on the right things and do it correctly. And if you don't know, you don't know. Uh, you, you, know you never know. Let, let, let us start off and say this. Who has the best information about a crime or a crime scene? Not the investigator. You're trying to compile a puzzle with lots of people lying to you, with pieces missing that you will never find. But you know what? The person who committed the crime is the best source of information. Remember, you as investigator will never know the exact truth. Never. You can get close to the exact truth. But you're always one step behind. Okay, yes. Thank you. Go. Okay. Um, I want to open the floor now for questions. I'm going to ask that you, you raise your hand if you want to ask a question. And then I will acknowledge your name and then you can unmute yourself and then you can ask um, Gideon. So please, or if you if you don't feel comfortable to ask on the on the platform, please just pop a question into the chat box. Yes, come people, there must be some questions. You must be wondering about some things. While you're wondering, I can tell you another story if you want to. If there's time please do. Share. I actually was involved in an investigation where a rapist, and this was also now, you can take it to modus operandi, which we did, and you can also take it to a signature because it's a very psychological thing. This rapist, they also, uh, it was actually robbery. They, start, they always committed, it was robberies against people in their homes, but one of the robbers would always uh, rape the, a female victim and one of the victims i remember was a very old lady and it's also a fallacy that you think they would rape good looking women they would rape women that's 80 years old i've seen it many times but this person to be able to get an erection had to stab the victim not stab them to death multiple small jabs to be able to get an erection to be able to to uh, to uh, uh, commit a, a rape, okay. and and that is that actually shows a very distinct modus operandi as well as a very distinct mm. psychological signature that he is unable oh. to get an erection except if he can get the person in a position of of power and then uh, commit these barbaric. Mm. Act. Guys, it's, um, it's very interesting, all these kinds of stuff that you see outside. Gideon, um, you've been talking specifically about serious and violent crimes now. Um, 
is oh. there is there something similar in the white collar crime space? You know, like your frauds. Oh yes. And, okay. Oh yes. Let us look, for instance, at uh, at uh, a fraudster. Mm -hmm. And a fraudster is the whole uh, uh, way of defrauding people depends on on the fraudster being able to assume a personality and an image and a story which is based on nonsense. They've, they've got things that are truthful, but they add to it. To be able to convince people of whatever he or she has to convince them of to make money out of them, to defraud them. Now, some people, and I've seen, let, let's say, fraudsters, will be nicely clad and they will focus on on old females uh, and, and, and they will use their charms to first of all charm the old lady and get into her how can I put it, her personal space or get into her personal affairs, into her environment and then convince her to, to give him money to whatever the, the case might be. With other words, fraudsters will have specific modus operandi. They mm -hmm. will have specific stories, images, how they speak, what they say, what the victim looks like. So, oh my, oh yes, most definitely. It's modus operandi is just as important in, in, in your normal fraud cases, private investigation cases. You see that all the time. But the way you see it is you have to go into detail. Mm. Case by case basis, detail, detail, detail. Okay. All but right. then the modus operandi is revealed. Yes. Okay. Does that answer that question in terms of, and, and, and what about other um, examples? Oh, I can't think of one now. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, no. If um, yeah, if something pops up, I'll, uh, we we can chat. Um, I yes. had a question here from one of our participants to, who who simply just asked if if it's compulsory to do the one year certificate with the ACFE. Um, I know you are a member of both the ACFE and I think the ICFP. Um, yes. Would you would you share with us? Um, your your experience is it is it worth getting these certifications or accreditations? I I, I can perhaps uh, number one no it, it 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 is not necessary or it's not a requirement an ultimate compulsory requirement. yeah yeah compulsory requirement but uh, for an investigator to, to obtain experience and the knowledge. You have to be associated somewhere, organizations that that will also enable you to interact with people that where you can gather your information from, interact with that, you get their stories and become better at investigation. So it's not compulsory, but it's beneficial mm. to do it. Okay. Uh, we had the advantage of being a detective in the police, if you can call that an advantage, but yes, it was. <laughs> so you had, you had a background mm. that gave you a lot of, of, of expertise, a lot of knowledge, how to do things. You were trained very well. You did the work. You saw how it was being done. Um, just for interest's sake, I've got a colleague who's a member of ACES International. Mm -hmm. That is a registered uh, association in Britain. Okay. Investiga uh, and he's a member of that one. He, he doesn't want to be a member of the ACFE. Okay. He believes in the ACES organization. Now, uh, the, the fact of the matter is you can be... Um, you get different ones. You get the International Security Management Institute or ISM. There are various institutions and mm -hmm. organizations worldwide yeah. that can assist that you can become a member of. You can choose. It's not compulsory that you have to mm. be a member of any, but it's always a good thing to, yeah. to associate with, with an organization that is mm. focused on the field that you are involved in. Yes. Yeah. Okay, Gideon, thank you. I, I don't see any more questions. Um, I'm going to give a last opportunity for people to ask questions. 
um, to raise their hand and perhaps ask a question. Um, I'm not seeing any hands go up. I'm not seeing anything in the chat. So without belaboring the point, Gideon, thank you very, very, very much once again for your time. I know, I know in the private sector, time is money. So, um, and you are doing what you are doing free of charge. You do not charge us. Yeah. Um, no, so no. really, this is, it is, it is such, always such an honor and a privilege. And every time I listen to you, I learn something new. And really, I appreciate, um, I appreciate you coming on board, sharing with us. And yes, we look forward to our, our next session, I, which is, I think, tomorrow. I can, yeah, I can perhaps say a lasting comment that you guys must take seriously. Guys, you know how you learn. You learn through other people. 90% of what mm. I know, well, not 90, less. I, I learn a lot through books and studying, but you've got mentors and you've got colleagues and you listen to their stories and you listen mm. to... Uh, they people who have been there before you yeah that is where you gain most of your practical street knowledge i actually told bernardine before we came on air that investigators are are straat brakker. now in english i think that's a street mongrels i think that's the word yes. that you must be street wise and that's where you learn you learn from people who are doing it on the street so get yourself people who are mentors and yeah. mentorships are 99% free of charge. Yeah. The best source are free of charge. Thank you. Kirion, thank you. And thank you, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining. And we will share the recording via the module site. Have an awesome day. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.